Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's WELL webinar, 10 Strategies for Women to Succeed and Lead in Business. I am Melinda E. Franklin, Chair of the Board of Directors for the San Francisco Chamber of Commerce and Managing Director at United Airlines. Such a pleasure to be here today. I'm excited for everyone to join us here for our third and final WELL event of 2020. And what a few months it's been. For those new to our program, WELL stands for Women Empowering Leadership and Learning. With a focus on empowerment, leadership, and education, WELL is the San Francisco Chamber's commitment to representing all genders at all levels and across all industries. 2020 has certainly been a trying year, which is probably the understatement of the year. The topics we have highlighted are even more important as we face the current pandemic. We have learned how women, and especially women of color, have been disproportionately impacted due to the COVID-19 pandemic crisis. And having heard from strong women who have broken through glass ceilings in male-dominated industries, and we've touched upon how important it is to have an inclusive workplace, even as the typical workplace continues to evolve. I had the prof profound um, honor to speak to Chef Dominique Crenn last week. And for those of you who have not been able to view that webinar, please do. She is a three-star Michelin uh, uh, restauranteur who has won many, many awards, but more importantly, is a, a deep and powerful soul. She, she um, touched on racial inequities, uh, climate change, um, success issues beyond, far and beyond uh, being in her profession. And, and indeed, she's, she's a powerful uh, role model for all of us. I invite you to visit our past webinars, all of our past webinars on the San Francisco Chamber of Commerce's YouTube channel. Great viewing pleasure across the board. So today we have another fantastic program and we'll discuss how, despite many companies are making efforts to promote diversity and inclusion, the gender bias persists in many, many, many industries and women face a variety of challenges over the course of their careers. Before we start today's program, I wanna thank a few sponsors who help make well possible. And all of these seminars today would not be, today and in the past few weeks would not have been possible without their support. An amazing company, Accenture, as well as Blue Shield of California, Visa, PG&E, Comcast, Hanson and Bridget, BlackRock, Recology, the Golden State Warriors, Fisher Phillips, Microsoft, Redwood Credit Union, and my favorite water, Hint, which I have a bottle right next to me. Thank you all for your support to advance the mission of WELL. Now a few housekeeping items before we get started. Below you will find the Q&A and chat options. I encourage you to ask questions and say hello to others watching along today. Please give your name and company and let everyone know you're here. It's always such a joy to see the diversity of companies represented on these webinars. Now I am incredibly excited to introduce today's speaker. Annie Lau, a partner at Fisher Phillips in the San Francisco and Houston offices. Annie counsels employers on preventive strategies, compliance matters, develops employee handbooks, policies and procedures, and training material. In addition to her practice as an attorney, Annie gained valuable experience during her time as a human resources manager and intern with the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, where she developed policy. I bet you you know my friend Polly Gasaki too, who works there. 
Annie will share her experiences and strategies for succeeding as a woman and as a minority in an organization. She advises and defends employers in all aspects of labor and employment law, including charges of discrimination, sexual harassment, retaliation, wage and hour, breach of contract, and other employment related claims. Annie, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Melinda. And thank you to the San Francisco Chamber of Commerce for having me. And today we're going to be talking about, well, the title of the presentation is 10 Strategies for Women to Succeed in Business. But, you know, I think as anyone can attest to, there's no surefire 10 step plan to, to be successful. And, you know, what we're going to be talking about today is just things that I, I have found to be valuable over the course of my career. And, you know, Melinda, you know, I'm, please jump in over the course of this conversation and share your wealth of experience. And, you know, we're also going to take questions throughout the course of, of this webinar. So feel free to, you know, type your Q and A's um, at the bottom of the screen and, you know, we'll answer them as they come in. So what we're discussing today, I think, you know, it, it's going to be different for, for every woman. And, you know, it, in my experience, a lot of, you know, what we see today in terms of integrity, in terms of, you know, just how folks approach business and interacting with others, uh, there's a lot of things that come into play that's important in terms of being successful, but doing it with integrity as well. So that's hopefully you know, something we'll, we'll be able to talk through today. Number one, so we're gonna st start our top 10 now. We're gonna talk a little bit about kind of the, the peripheral, peripheral things that you might not think about necessarily in terms of trying to be successful in your organization. And you know, today it's, it's kind of funny because I'm, I'm in a role of a, a litigator. And I remember growing up, my mom always told me that I would get red in the face just talking to anybody. It could be a salesperson at a store, it could be, you know, just somewhat a stranger on the street, I would get very red in the face. And um, I was shy, I just didn't like talking to people. And imagine doing presentations like this, or having to go to court and argue in front of a judge or deal with um, an opposing counsel. So, you know, that's, that's nothing I thought would be ahead in my career for me. But you know, when I, when I started at Fisher Phillips, one of the things that they made us do was get out of our comfort zone and do presentations like this and speak to people. And, and, you know, they, I don't want to say force us to do it, but that was certainly expected. And, you know, it's, it's helped me so much along the way in terms of building my confidence and being able to speak in front of people. So, you know, if I stayed in my bubble, you know, I, I had always thought I would be a transactional lawyer where I would just, you know, sit in front of papers and look at contracts and not have to deal with people all the time. And, Never did what I have imagined I, I would be a litigator and, you know, doing what I do today. So I would say, you know, one of the things in terms of getting out of your comfort zone is to volunteer for things that you might not necessarily feel, feel comfortable for. In the past, I would only volunteer for things I, I was knowledgeable about and which was a very, very small set of things, but I would only volunteer for things or speak up about things I knew about. Um, but I noticed that that wasn't necessarily true for my male counterparts. They would just volunteer information that you know, wasn't necessarily correct. They would um, they would volunteer for projects, which I'm pretty sure they had no no knowledge about, um, but they acted confident um, and they they would be able to figure it out. So, you know, that's and that's what you can do. Go out of your comfort zone, even if it's something that you don't know, you can figure it out. And that's 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 what you need to do. And you'll, you'll learn in the process and you'll figure it out. And, you know, once you're able to show that you have this knowledge now that then, you know, people will come to you for new projects and things. So next slide, please. Number two, it's okay to say, I don't know. And I, I think this comes with experience. Also, I remember in the past, especially early in my career, I would be terrified of getting on a phone call with, with a client. I felt like I had to be prepared for any and every question that they might ask. I had to read every case that might even potentially apply, I had to know every law that, you know, that might apply to them. 
and I was I was terrified. Um, I think, you know, over the course of the years, as I naturally did become more experienced, you know, maybe maybe with with more experience and more knowledge, um, it gave me the confidence to say, I don't I don't know. And, you know, that that will come with with time. I think in the past, I didn't want to appear stupid. Um, I felt like I, I needed to know everything. But now now I'm OK with getting on a call and saying, you know what, I, I don't know the answer to that, but let me let me look into it and find out. So I think that that follow up is always the important part saying, you know, I don't know, but I'll get that answer to you soon. And in the process, you'll, again, learn something new that you didn't didn't know before. So it's OK to say, I don't know, but follow, that follow up is always the important part. Next slide, please. Own up to your mistakes. So the, the next few slides, I think, kind of tie tie into each other. And I, I hope everyone is uh, appreciating my clip art game here. <laughs> um, I, I scoured the internets um, and interwebs for, for some clip art for this presentation so that you'd have some, some visual uh, effects. But, you know, I think in terms of owning up to your mistakes, you know, we're, we're all going to make them throughout the course of our career. And it's, it's very important in terms of when these mistakes happen, how do you react and, uh, and how do you handle it? And, you know, what's always been important to me is don't throw someone else under the bus. You know, as in, in my career, if something goes wrong, eventually something will, you know, what's, what's your response? Are you going to say, oh, well, this, this other lawyer screwed it up. It's, it's my assistant's fault. Is that, is that going to fix the problem? Absolutely not. At the end of the day, the buck stops with you. And, you know, kind of thinking a few, few, few more steps down the line, what's going, to, what do you think is going to happen to the person that you did throw under the bus? Do you think that they're, they're going to have your back in the future? So, you know, own up to your mistakes. Um, you know, don't, don't take steps that are going to create further consequences for you, for you down the future. And if, if you're anything like me, it, you'll probably beat yourself up more than anyone else um, over uh, any mistake that you might have made. And, you know, you'll, you'll learn from your mistakes and your failures. And if, for, for me, I probably learned more from my mistakes um, than it, they were more ingrained in me than from anything I might have learned from a book. So let's keep going. Let's move to the next Let me, let me ask a question there, Annie. Sure. Just, yeah. just about... Um, it, 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 it's more to the culture of the organization. So, you know, some cultures are healthier than others in terms of finger pointing and, uh, you know, why did this happen? Whose fault it is? How, how do you navigate through that? You know, you want to own up, but at the same time, you need to protect yourself. So how does one do that in a work situation? Right. And I, I think that's always a, a tough question in terms of you know, the politics in the workplace also, you, you do need to protect yourself for sure. And, you know, if it's something, I, I think the follow-up is important, making sure that you emphasize, you know, figure out why the mistake happened in the first place. You know, did someone else have some play in it um, or is it something that purely falls in your lap? And, you know, I think a, maybe a conversation for with those who are involved in the project and saying, hey, look, we may have all collectively participated in this, I wouldn't say, well, look, Jane, Jane did this, and this is why this, this happened. I think is part of that is, look, I think this is a collective issue, and this was my part in it, and, you know, we're going to make sure to fix this problem, make sure that it never happens again. Um, and, you know, I, I think most folks these days understand that things happen. It's how you, how are you going to fix the problem is the important part. Let's say, you know, in the legal world, some type of filing went wrong. Are you, how are you going to fix it? That now that this has happened, what are you going to do about it? And, and go from there, you know, to the extent that, you know, someone else tries to throw you under the bus, I, that, that can happen too. You know, I think the, the main aspect is, you know, defend yourself for sure. I'm not saying fall on your sword and, you know, let other people who are culpable, <laughs> get away with anything. Don't fall on your sword necessarily. But if you're the one that screwed up something, you know, don't try to blame it on, on someone else, I think is, is the main thing. 
Um, and I, what what has your experience been in terms of dealing with stuff like this? Well, I'll, I'll just go back to two things that you said. Don't, don't burn bridges. I mean, you still yeah. have to work with these folks uh, regardless. And there's always going to be office dynamics, office politics, as you said. And then also, especially during time of COVID now, excellence, not perfection, right? There, There is going to be more <laughs> Um, random kind of spontaneous things that happen in the workplace and we all have to trust each other and make good decisions given the moments we're in and 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 do the best we can do so I, I think there needs to be some um, latitude and forgiveness on things that you know are not catastrophic mistakes it's like you, you pick your battles on you know how how you approach these things so right and, and I, one of the things I think about also, especially let's say if someone else makes a mistake, I, I do think about how I approach them and address them in terms of whatever mistake that happened there. And I, I do try to afford that, that forgiveness and grace because I, I put myself in that those shoes and say, if I had done this, how would I want to be addressed in terms of, you know, if it were my boss dealing with me, what's the most effective way in terms of you know acknowledging what happened um but moving forward without you know, it, again if it's a cons consistent thing that's a different issue but you know hopefully these are one-off type of situations where a mistake happens and you know you acknowledge it hopefully you get forgiven for it and you move on so um well let's let's keep going to the next slide maintain your integrity unfortunately these uh that's somewhat lacking today in some of the leadership that that we see on the news but i, I think in terms of um acknowledging and, and owning your your mistakes ties into integrity and you know for me at least i think that's such an important part in terms of you know your growth in your organization and, and how you handle yourself and how you deal with others um is so important um you know, kind of what we were just talking about, you know, thinking about uh, maintaining your integrity in, in different contexts. If you're dealing with someone who you view has no integrity, and that person lies, that person isn't good on their word, do you, do you want to work with this person? The answer is going to be no. How are you going to deal with um, that type of person? You're going to avoid them. You're going to maybe share about what your experience with them has been with others and you're not going to do them any favors. So that's how you're going to interact with someone who lacks integrity and you certainly don't want to be with that person. And you know, just, just a, a personal example, um, last year actually I had a case where an opposing counsel brought a camera, brought their personal camera into a deposition and didn't tell us about it set it up right next to the official recording camera. So we didn't even notice it and began recording before any of us even walked into the room. That is actually illegal <laughs> in California. And we didn't know about it until we were taking a break. They were walking out of the room and the official videographer said, hey, are you gonna keep this camera running? So that was, a huge integrity issue and probably something I could have brought up to the ethics board about, um, and which we did raise with the judge judge also later. But think about how I, I would interact with that lawyer later. Am I going to trust anything that this lawyer does? Am I going to be sending CYA emails all day, every day, so that you know it might be a piece of evidence I use in front of a judge? So, you know, think about that example. And do you want to have a reputation of someone that does not have integrity? Absolutely not. Now, if you're dealing with someone who you view does have integrity, you're going to want to work with that person. You're going to recommend that person say, hey, you know what, that's a good guy. That's a good person um, to work with. And you, you, you're going to refer them. You're going to recommend them to others. You're going to you know, recommend them for promotions within your organization. And that's that's going to be the same way with you if you're the person um, that others view ha that have integrity. So, yeah, I, for me, at least, I think, you know, the integrity piece of it is such an important part in terms of, you know, as you, as you move up in your career and further along in your career, uh, you know, you do want to be viewed as, as a leader with, that has integrity in terms of how you, how you handle matters. 
All right, let's keep moving to the next slide, please. Stop apologizing. One of the things I, I struggled with a lot in early in my career, I would, I would apologize for anything and everything. I would knock on someone's door and say, sorry for, sorry for bothering you. Um, you know, didn't mean to disturb you. Uh, I would, I would send an email, not hear back for, for several days, follow up emails, didn't hear anything, but you know, the other person wasn't responding to me, but the, my emails would say, well, sorry for following up. Um, sorry for this. Sorry for that. It was just uh, apologizing for a lot of things that I, I didn't need to uh, apologize for. And, you know, again, kind of going back to a few slides ago, if you truly screwed up, um, if you truly made a mistake, then, you know, take a winner's share, apologize, get over it, move on. Um, but, you know, think about what, and, you know, I, I think in my mind, when I was doing all of this apologizing in some sort of way that somehow uh, demonstrated that I was being respectful uh, to the other person, that I was being respectful of that person's time or, you know, interrupting them or, or something like that. So maybe in, in some weird way in my mind, I thought that was a, a way of showing respect. But, you know, I think the actual impression that it gave to others was that, you know, I was not confident. I was I was timid. And, you know, that's that's not necessarily the, the image that I wanted to project to others. And, you know, that that may impede your chances in terms of what projects you work on. You know, if you're if, you know, others that you work with view you as timid and not confident, are they going to recommend you to work on certain projects? Are they going to recommend you to interact with clients um, or, or work on projects that, you know, might be contentious, and especially in my role as a lawyer in the legal world? How are you going to stand up to an opposing counsel or argue something in front of a judge if you know you're constantly apologizing and appearing timid. So, you know, at least early in my career, that's something I had to, you know, tell myself in my head, stop apologizing over nothing. <laughs> so, you know, I think, you know, that's something I even tell um, some associates that I work with now who, who do the same thing. I'll, I'll get an email um, that says, sorry for, you know, bugging you in the middle of the day. I was like, don't apologize, <laughs> it's all good. Just send me the email and uh, it's fine. So, you know, I think that this is something that's probably more common though than we might expect it to be. Yeah, let me jump in on that, Annie. Um, yeah. I actually just apologized for something yesterday that was totally not my fault on a <laughs> webinar, which said, give an optimistic something nugget about the future of travel. And it's, it's such a hard time right now. And he said, oh, God, sorry. I don't think there is really, you know. But I was thinking, oh, I should have said sorry. But I, I, I totally get you on that. But we do have a question from Carrie in Denver. And her question is, we can talk about how women start sentences with, I'm sorry, as you said, statistically more than men. Women also experience higher levels of guilt and toxic self-blame. How can we combat this? That's a good question. I, I think for me, I had to consciously tell myself, stop apologizing. Don't walk into a room and start apologizing. Um, it, it takes conscious effort because I think I, for whatever reason, growing up throughout our careers, we've just kind of put our positions where we're almost, you know, put in a Backfooted position where you know we're apologizing for things that have no need to um, apologize for, and it, I think it does take conscious effort. Think about how how your male counterparts um, deal deal with certain situations. How, how does your male counterpart walk into a room um, if someone comes and knocks on your door? You know, are they saying sorry? You know, whatever, um, or are they saying, hey, you know, I've got this question for you. You know, and it, it takes it takes practice. It's not going to happen overnight. I still say it. I still say sorry sometimes occasionally. So in my head though, I in the back of my mind I'm said, Oh, I just I just said that. I didn't need to apologize for anything. Um, you know, and the occasional sorry is no big deal. I think it's it's just when you're constantly it's it's just a reflex action when you're walking into a room, when you're sending an email, when you're knocking on a door, um, you know. I think if you if you consciously put it in your mind that you you don't need to apologize for everything, um, I think that'll slowly start changing your behavior. Yeah, I think that's that's a great 
Great answer because it's 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 there and, and respectfully, you and I are both Asian Americans. So I think there's some some deep rooted historical respectful thing that yeah. is going on with our parents as well there. So I'm not sure, but certainly I, I appreciate your your response to that. Yeah, absolutely. I think culture definitely takes play, plays a part into it. So and you know what kind of environment you grew up in if you were taught to be, you know, respectful of your elders and, you know, don't interrupt and all of that, that, that certainly might, might play a part into it. So, but, you know, I think even more broadly, I, I see that happen a lot, um, especially with, with um, folks that are younger and earlier in their careers. And I think maybe it's a process of just building up that confidence and, um, you know, just ask what you're going to ask. Don't apologize for asking it. <laughs> so, um, all righty, next slide, please. Don't be a jerk. I was going to use a different word instead of jerk, but I thought in case anybody wanted a copy of these slides, I, I'd be a little bit, uh, <laughs> play it a little safer. But I really meant to say don't be an asshole. Um, I think, you know, certainly I do not mean don't stick up for yourself. I do not mean, uh, I, I want you to be aggressive when you need to be, don't get bullied. When I say don't be an asshole, I don't mean any of those things. You know, be aggressive when you need to be, don't get bullied, stand up for yourself, absolutely. I will, especially as a lawyer, you're, you have to be aggressive if you're gonna advocate for your client. Um, and I will always respect someone who is being aggressive, advocating for client, doing what they're supposed to, to do, um, to, to be the best lawyer they can for their case, but I will not respect someone. And you know, how do you how do you define being an asshole? I, I think that's kind of a vague question. Also, I think in my mind, I think of it as you know, going out of your way to stick it to somebody. You know, going out of your way to make someone look bad. Um, that's I, I think that's if I were to try to define it, that that would try be be my definition <laughs> of being a a jerk or an asshole. And you know, it ties in it ties in with the integrity piece of it, you know, treat people with respect. And that that doesn't necessarily mean only to treat people that um, you want to impress or someone that you report to or someone that you think that can help you in your career somewhere along the way. It, it applies to everyone. It applies to people that report to you. Um, it applies to, you know, the janitor that might clean your building. It could apply to, you know, security, servers at a restaurant, your taxi driver. Even opposing counsel, in my case, as as um, as a lawyer, and you know, I think one of my colleagues just told me very recently that he had a case with someone where they, the opposing counsel and him, were appearing before a judge, and the judge was, you know, really kind of ripping into the the other other lawyer. Now, you know, probably inside your head, you're thinking, yeah, I'm probably going to win this argument, but you know, I think. You know, the other other lawyer was very graceful in terms of how how he handled his argument, didn't put the other side down um, and was respectful in his argument. And in the long run, that opposing counsel went in house and ended up becoming my colleague's client. So, you know, you, you never know who you're going to be talking to down the line, uh, you know, whether it's someone you think um, that. You're, you'll never see again, or you know, someone you have regular interaction with. I think it's it's important to just keep in mind, you know, don't don't be an asshole. Um, you know, you never know where your paths are going to cross again, and even if they don't cross, um, you know, there's certainly no reason for it. And um, I think it's just that ties so heavily into the in integrity piece of it. You want to be respectful to you know people that you work with, whether they report to you, whether you report to them. Or you know they they just might be you know cleaning your building so so that's well yeah I I, I want to jump in here just for a moment um, yeah. in terms of that goes back to the building bridges theme mm -hmm. um, but also you know we and we addressed this last week with Chef Kren the um, uh, bullying and 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 if you're actually witnessing someone uh, being mistreated maybe one of your coworkers maybe one of the younger women or, or men in the firm. So the question from Donna in DC is, how can we advocate for other women in the workplace? Any experiences where someone stood up for you and or you stood up for someone? 
That ties into our, our next slide, actually. Oh, well, there you go. There <laughs> perfect you go. question and perfect yeah. timing. Great. Um, if you can go to the next slide, perfect. So support others and, and build other, others up. And I'm, I'm trying to think of specific examples for myself, but I think, you know, most of us have heard um, somewhere along the way where, you know, women have struggled with, you know, not being heard in meetings. Let's say in a meeting, you know, where um, a woman might have expressed an idea or, or, or made a statement and, you know, it's not really acknowledged. And then a man might say something exactly the same later and they're praised and they're like, what a good idea. Um, or a woman has been, is often interrupted when they're speaking um, or just simply, you know, their opinion's not respected. So I think, you know, these are things that we've often heard and a lot of people have experienced um, in, in the workplace. And, you know, what, what can we do to help that um, in terms of supporting others and building others up? And, you know, I think, you know, examples that I've seen and I've utilized in, in my own experiences, let's say, you know, Jessica, uh, you, you got interrupted. What, what were you saying before? You know, bring it back. If someone got interrupted, you know, if, you know, you can, you are, you are someone that can bring it back and say, Hey, you just got interrupted before. What were you saying? Continue your thought. Or, you know, let's say, you know, someone, Amy, I'm just, I'm just using random names. Amy, that's, that's a good idea. I'm glad you raised that just to, you know, help validate uh, an idea that someone brought forward. Or let's say, you know, a guy had basically repeated something that someone else said, you know, my, my response might be, yeah, you know, I think that's a good, good idea. And I think that's what Alyssa said before. And, you know, you both raise a good point. You know, these are, you know, kind of subtle, non-confrontational ways where you can, you know, support other, other women, let's say in a, in a meeting context. Um, you know, I think for me, you know, I have brought, you know, younger associates or summer clerks with me to client meetings. Um, and, or, you know, bring, bringing them to you know, a mediation I might have or a deposition. And, you know, if there are rules about who, who can appear, you, you can ask for permission. And I would say almost 10 times out of 10, you know, the mediator or the judge or whoever the client are like, absolutely bring them, you know, this is good experience for them. And, you know, this, they can see how, you know, this process works or, you know, they get to interact with the client or the judge. And, you know, these are, these are just some things that um, I think are helpful. And, you know, I think, unfortunately, some of the things that I've also heard that sometimes women are women's biggest obstacles. Um, I've, I've heard folks say, you know, a certain woman has been the most difficult for person for me to deal with, and they seem to be gunning for me. And, you know, that might be true. Sometimes, you know, certain women might feel threatened. Um, some women might enjoy the fact that they're the only one in their on their team or in a position of leadership. And, you know, that's that's not who we want to be. That's not how we move forward um, as women. Um, so, you know, let's not be our own obstacle. Um, should we get into positions of leadership, especially, you know, we want to lift each other up. Uh, we want to mentor others. We want to encourage women to succeed and recommend them for opportunities. Um, and it, it applies to men too. I think, you know, it, over the course of my career, um, men, there are many men that have been some of my greatest champions. So, you know, I think, you know, that mentorship process and just inclusion and saying, hey, that's a good idea. Can you repeat yourself or you got interrupted? You know, these are little, little things I think that, that can help us a lot along the way. Thanks, Annie. And we have about uh, 15 minutes. Um, and I know we have a few more slides, but I did want to get one other question in uh, from Deanna in New York City. Uh, she talks about uh, the debate last night and without being political, but that whole mansplaining issue, it, it seemed to come out a bit last night. Again, I'm not making a political statement at all. I think um, we all have seen this in um in business and and politics, nonprofits, all different realms of life. Uh, but her question is: Is there any workplace community groups that have been successful, especially during COVID, as we are mostly remote? I don't know if your expertise is nationwide, but certainly San Francisco and any other organizations that you think are are really on top of these issues. 
Um, I have to confess that I did not watch the debate. I actually have been actively avoiding <laughs> the the debates to save myself some angst and, and stress. But <laughs> in terms of organizations, I think, you know, first check if you have organizations um, within your own organization uh, that, you know, let's say it's a women's group or um, some type of uh, minority group. We, in, in, at Fisher Phillips, we have what we call a Wilk group. And I always have to, I I get stuck on these acronyms now that I don't know what they actually stand for sometimes. But we have something called a Wilk group, which stands for Women's Initiative and Leadership Council. And we have regular meetings um, over Zoom. And, you know, we talk about uh, various things that affects the organization um, or just, you know, even what we might be struggling with. You know, a lot of folks are at home working while they have to take care of their kids and all of that. Um, you know, we've had uh, we've had someone in my office that just had a baby. And, you know, there are obviously a lot of different things that, you know, a new mom deals with. So, you know, we've we've developed a lot of um, uh, new plans. And uh, I would say we I, I'm trying to find the right word for it, but different things that we were offering to new moms, um, like a milk delivery program, um, you know, just just resources for for folks that you know might be within a particular group. I think um, you know we have a it, in my firm. We also have a an Asian American group that you know we we discuss things with. So you know, first and foremost, I would say look within your org, own organization to see if that exists, or even maybe something that you might be interested in starting um, externally. You know, a lot of the organizations that I'm involved involved in. Um, relate to the legal world. So I don't know how applicable that is to, to folks on this call, but um, there's a program that I'm involved in called LCLD, and that stands for, gosh, there's acronyms again, uh, but legal, uh, legal Council, Leadership Council for Legal Diversity. And it includes, um, you know, pretty senior level attorneys from both law firms and, and um, companies. And it has been one of the best organizations I have been involved in where people have authentic conversations. And, you know, so a lot of these organizations, you feel like they're one of those like networking, here's my business card, you know, it's just, you know, how can I get business from you? I, I, I don't like things like that. But this, that particular organization, LCLD has been so valuable to me. I've made friends with them, you know, I text with them about various things, um, as you know, especially with, with all that's going on in the world right now. I think you want to find, you know, that that core group of people where you can trust and have honest um, conversations. Um, if you if you belong to a particular faith, then you know that's also a, a resource for you as well. I, I know that you know I, I go to a church and we have um, had these small groups. Um, one of the groups that I joined is called racial reconciliation in light of everything that's going on in the world these days. So, you know, there's a lot of different, um, resources out there in organizations. I think, you know, it, in terms of professionally, if something doesn't exist already within your organization, consider starting something yourself. So, Great advice. Um, so let's get back to the slides. I'll try not okay. to interrupt you again, but no, this is, I, I'd much rather, <laughs> Much rather have it be interactive, and I'll, I'll, I'll move quickly um, in the last few slides. Um, next slide, please. Okay, make the ask. You know, as altruistic, or you know, even if you love your organization and think you know there's they're the bee's knees, <laughs> um, you know, you have to make the ask. Uh, I think you know, some women's careers aren't where they want them to be for for various reasons. Um, you know, I think some of those reasons is that we we get in our own way. We, we don't, we think we're not qualified for certain positions, so we don't even bother applying. Um, they think, oh, you know, this, this job calls for 10 years of experience. I only have eight, so I'm not even going to bother, um, I'm not even going to bother applying. So, you know, we end up kind of give, getting in our own way because we, we, we think, you know, we haven't hit, dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's that a position may ask for it. And I can almost guarantee you that any man or you know guy that applies for that position isn't isn't putting themselves down in the same way. Um, you know, if you think that you know guys are completely qualified for positions that they uh, apply for, that's just not the case. Um, and I think even in the best of organizations, we can't automatically expect them to you know shuffle opportunities our way or 
or do things that are in our best interest, frankly. Um, I think, and you have to fight for these opportunities. I think just, just as, you know, a very simple example, when I, when I moved out to California with my current firm, um, I had to ask for, for a pay increase because of, you know, cost of living and all of that. I, I think if I didn't ask for it, they might not have automatically given it to me. So even for little things like that, you know, um, you, you make the ask. And, you know, I think as the saying goes, you miss 100% of the chances that you don't take. So, you know, I, I think that's, that's very important. So next slide, please. This might be a slightly controversial one. <laughs> don't take everything personally. Um, you know, again, I'm not saying don't stick up for yourself or, you know, I'm not saying don't take appro appropriate action when necessary. When necessary. However, that being said, people make mistakes. People will say the wrong things without having a bad intention. Um, I think as we were kind of talking about before, you know, we're going to be in that place at some point where we say something that, you know, inadvertently offends someone. Um, give grace because goodness knows we'll need it at some point. Um, I think just as a, a an example, I had a, an Asian friend who was offended because someone confused her for another Asian person. And literally weeks later, she confused a black woman for another black woman. And I was like, oh, isn't, isn't that kind of uh, funny? You were, you were so upset about it and you just made the same mistake. So, you know, and there's, there's, I think there's a certain de degree of um, grace that needs to be afforded to each other. Everyone's going to, to make mistakes, you know, you know, we're, I think there's a certain degree of skin thickness that you need to develop over the course of your career also. And again, this is, I am in no way, shape or form saying tolerate discrimination or harassment in any way whatsoever. Um, you know, if, it, if it's something that happens regularly, if it's a, um, if it's a case of ignorance, you know, take it as an opportunity, opportunity to, you know, gently educate maybe, you know, I, I'm always someone who appreciates frank conversations. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's, that's just me being on my pedestal. <laughs> okay, last slide, please. Learn when to walk away. And, you know, I think the main thing to take away from, from this is, is know your value. You know, if you feel like you're not growing within your organization, if you feel like your organization isn't growing, um, if you're consistently making that ask, and you're not getting a response, uh, you know, maybe, maybe it's, it's time to walk away. And, you know, I think what's also important is defining what success is to you, because that looks like something different for everyone. People often define success as, you know, becoming a, a partner in the law firm. But I, every time I talk with someone, um, I emphasize that is not the definition of success. You know, that someone else's definition of success might just be to be a good lawyer and, you know, have good work-life balance and have a family. It might be, you know, work not to become a partner. For a long time, I had no ambition whatsoever to make partner. I, I would be perfectly happy staying as an associate or of, a, of counsel in a, in a law firm. Um, you know, does it, what do, does it, being successful mean, you know, starting your own company, maybe starting your own business? Does it mean, you know, working part time and doing something else? Does it mean not working at all in the corporate world and you know, raising a family? Um, it's a very, very different definition for, for everyone. And, uh, you know, don't let uh, what a company might define success be that definition for you. I think, you know, at the end of at the end of the day, any organization, no matter how they how good they've been to you, you know, their question is going to be, what are you going to do for me next? And you know, I think the question you want to ask yourself is, you know, how do I define success for myself? And, you know, is the organization I'm with currently fit fit within that definition? And if not, you know, do, should I should I be walking away and pursuing something else, maybe? So yeah, when someone told me a, 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 something a long time ago and they said, make sure that your organization or company loves you as much as you love them. You know, so it's the love me back thing. So just like a relationship, right? <laughs> hey, one more question and then we're going to wrap. And this is from Sylvia in Mexico City. Can you talk about membership, mentorship 
how is it important for up and coming women in the workplace and have, are you a mentor now and have you been mentored in your career? I, I think there are different forms of mentorship. Uh, there, a lot of organizations have formal mentor programs where, you know, you're paired with this person and you guys need to have, you know, lunch or calls once a month or something like that. And, you know, there's certain benefits for that, but I think for, for me, the, the, most valuable mentorship relationships for me have been have been informal. Um, you know, it's been developed out of relationships just because you have a relationship with this person. And you know, yes, that I've, I've had these types of mentors, and I'm trying to be mentors to those um, in my life right now. I've I've had clients who have become my mentors because you know they've they've had life experiences where you know we've developed a relationship where you know if we're grabbing dinner, you know, they're sharing their life experiences with me. And you're know, asking me how I'm doing, how my own uh, career has been going. And, you know, I think that's what I try to impart on those around me. Also, I've got, you know, associates that I work with and law school, law school students or, you know, summer associates that we have where, you know, I think I mentioned before, I try to bring them along to, you know, a mediation or a court appearance or something. So they have that exposure or meeting with a client. Um, you know, I have certainly have brought folks to um, client meetings and, you know, a lot of what we've talked about today during this webinar are things that I've talked about with um, folks that, you know, I, I, I'd like to think I, I informally mentor. And, you know, it's not just women that, that I have these conversations with. It's, it's um, men, um, young men in their career also. So, um, you know, a lot of what we talked about today, I think, are, are things that I talk about in my mentorship relationships. Well, that's great. And thank you, Annie. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an, an enlightening, um, candid discussion. And thank you for telling us about what you've gone through in your career, both highs and lows and ups and downs. And you're certainly a role model to, to many of us watching today. So thank you again. I also want to give a big shout out to Accenture and all of our sponsors. Thank you to the audience for joining us today. Please make sure to visit sfchamber.com to learn more about upcoming events. And we hope to see all of you at our next well event in early 2021. Stay safe and be happy. We'll get through this together. Thank you. Bye-bye.